Now, our next speaker is a very personal friend and colleague as well, um, Dr. Human Zernkelk. I've had the pleasure of knowing him now for a number of years and just uh, uh, a true uh, gifted clinician and, and a great human being. I've really enjoyed uh, his friendship over these years. He's uh, received his dental degree from Loma Linda University and following dental school, he spent uh, time as a research fellow in oral and maxillofacial surgery at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center in Parkland, uh, Parkland Hospital. And after this, he then went back to Loma Linda to begin his surgical residency and certainly completed that. And at this point now is practicing in Ventura, California. He is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. He's a fellow of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons and American College of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Again, maintains a, a wonderful private practice with special interests in reconstructive jaw surgery and complex dental implant rehabilitation. And with that said, I give you my great friend and colleague, Dr. Human Zarenkelk. Well, thank you, Mike, and thank you uh, everyone for joining us. It's a uh, a beautiful day here in Southern California. It's eight o'clock in the morning, and it's a good uh, it's a good day to present uh, these uh, cases that we learn the most from, or what I like to call a case from hell. Uh, these are not obviously patients from hell, but the cases a lot of times from hell. And these are the cases that we learn the most from. And I know you guys really like to see these things because that's how we really learn. In treatment of all these patients, I think. Uh, what our goals are pretty simple in these edentulous patients. And for me, the goals are always to essentially provide 12 teeth per arch per patient and to have the patient wear a fixed appliance throughout. And what the patients really want is for to not have any bone grafting done. That has been our experience, that those are simple goals. And those are in line with what Dr. Vandermark was uh, teaching us, is to try to keep treatment as simple as possible for the patients so that you can treat more patients and more patients can accept treatment. But one thing we also have to remember that sometimes the simplification of treatment, if we're not careful, can get us into trouble. A case in this point, a point in this case, this is a young lady that presented to us for, uh, for treatment and she was adamant to not have any bone grafting done. And she also had some time constraints. And when we look at her radiographs, we can see that obviously she has a failing dentition, uh, she has significant atrophy of her anterior maxilla, and she has pneumatized sinuses as well. But if we look really closely, we also notice, notice these large abscess in the anterior maxilla, which is one of the key positions that we have to place an implant if we're going to do a traditional all-on-four type of an approach. When we look at the uh, sagittal views, you can really appreciate this uh, abscess or bone defect in the anterior maxilla. And when you look at it clinically and more carefully, you notice that this abscess, when I removed the teeth, was also actually extending significantly into the entire alveolus. And essentially, this portion of the maxilla was not suitable for placement of an implant. These concavities or these undercuts in the bone were also a problem. Now, remember that she wanted no bone grafting done, no delay, and she had a time constraint so that this had to be done as an immediate load type of approach. So on the left side of the patient, we obviously were able to do a traditional half of an all-on-four with an angled implant, an axial implant in the anterior maxilla. On the right side, you can see my pencil mark here, an angled implant was placed, but remember that this portion of the maxilla was really not usable. I was able to get a 10 millimeter implant in the canine position without hitting the tip of that uh, distal implant. So the decision was made to utilize essentially unilateral or uni zygoma implant in the anterior maxilla. And patient was closed up and received an, an immediate appliance, which was uh, well done. And she ended up being a, a very happy, successful treatment as far as we're concerned. When we look at the radiographs, you see the implants are positioned appropriately. The zygoma is uh, in good position and she was treated very successfully. But I want you to keep in mind, as we've heard before, where the position of this implant is in relationship of the entire zygoma, or the position trajectory and the position of that implant. 
And will that be a problem later on? Is this an error? Which brings us to our to my case from hell. Uh, this is uh, Scott. He presented to us about three and a half, four years ago. It's still ongoing. Uh, he's a very healthy 47-year-old, I believe, at that time, and presented to us with this situation, essentially a dental cripple, uh, wanted uh, a, a restoration of the maxilla. And when we look at this case, when I treat and plan this case, it looked pretty slam dunk to me. Uh, we could do an angled implant on the left side, the two anterior axial implants, and obviously on the right side, uh, there's no a bone in uh, zone three so or, or zone two. So we were, pay, we were fo forced to place a zygoma implant on that one side. And that's very routine. That's not an unusual situation. So uh, we, we thought very confident, uh, proceeded to uh, go to surgery. This is our surgical guide that we use uh, every time to uh, give us the position of the, uh, the anterior teeth so that we make sure we have enough bone reduction and uh, the implants were placed as I go on the right side very uneventfully. I think Carlos can agree that this is a fairly decent position with the implant. All implants very stable in good bone. He had actually a very dense bone and it was uh, a very very simple uh, straightforward procedure. Multi-unit abutments were placed, the angulations were corrected, uh, and the uh, comfort caps were placed, and the patient was turned over to a prosthetic uh, prosthodontist. And this is our post-operative radiograph. Uh, and if you look at the, the position of implants are pretty reasonable. And when we look at the cross-sectionals, we see that uh, maybe they're not so well done as this implant is uh, protruding into the sinus of the nose, and so is this one. But by and large, the implants were very stable, and we know that protruding into the into the sinus or the floor of the nose up to a certain degree is not a problem. And I finished this case thinking that we're in good shape and uh, we can proceed. I remember this patient only paid me for an all on four type of procedure with one zygoma. Three months later, we were getting close to uh, finishing our start the fabrication of our final appliance. Uh, the prosthodontist called me and said, I think we have a little problem. The one implant on the right side is not doing well. I said, no problem. Send him over and I will take care of it. We have three good implants. He can ride on the three implants and I can fix that. Brought the patient in as an emergency, uh, a little local anesthesia, a small mini flap. Obviously, that implant had failed. We removed it. He had good bone there. There was nothing in the way. I placed an angled implant in the just distal to the defect. And I felt extra generous that day, placed another implant in midline, multi-unit abutments. Now I have five really good implants and closed it up. He went back to the prosthodontist. The prosthesis was modified to, uh, to now be loaded on five implants. And I thought, He's paid me for one all on four. What's an extra couple of implants? It's no big deal. We're good to go. And this is our radiograph a few months later. So between now and then, this implant was lost. This implant was lost. And the prosthodontist said, I think you need to look at it because there's something going on around this implant now. I remember these implants were all in good bone. No infection, very, very stable to start with. So I said, no problem, send the patient back and I'll see what I can do. Remove the appliance to deal with this implant and this implant came out with the appliance. Now remember this was lost a few weeks before. We thought we were gonna replace this implant, but also this one came out as I unscrewed the appliance to take it out to start working on this. No problem. I can deal with that. Now we have two good zygoma implants and we're missing all of our anterior implants now. So what is there to do? Well, we all know that's not, a, that's not an uh, issue. Uh, we can convert the patient to essentially a zygoma quad. I remember again, the patient has only paid me for an all on four. So two more, Zygoma implants were placed. 
uh, one on the right side anterior, one on the left side on the anterior. And I think the position of the implants are very reasonable. Uh, this was done, as I said, uh, I believe four years ago. So at that time, this, this was, uh, I think, pretty, pretty reasonable placement. I thought I was in good shape now. We have now quads that go, and I have great success with those. Should not be no problem. We're good to go now. This is the position of our implants again. And I felt uh, generous that day. Uh, took out my resorbable membranes and tacks. Did a nice bone graft to try to rebuild this uh, defects that the patient had developed, anticipating knowing the patient, the history of the patient that who knows, we may have to want to come back and put more implants in the front just for more support. Grafted it, closed it up, looked good, turned it over to the prosthodontist and say, let's redo the prosthesis, let's do, redo the provisional, and we'll come back and look at this later. Now, again, I want you to look at the position of that implant, the zygoma implant on the left side. And is this going to be something that will come back to bite us? And as uh, another uh, Dr. Nicolopoulos uh, has uh, alluded to. A few months later, we were waiting for the integration and we wanted to proceed with the final prosthesis. And the, uh, this, I'm sorry, this is the best radiograph we could get with some motion artifact, uh, but uh, I thought there was something going on with this distal implant. I got a periapical x-ray, and sure enough, uh, there's an issue there. So took the patient back, removed that implant, and placed the zygoma implant. Now, remember, because of the position of that this anterior zygoma, the trajectory of our zygoma and the, poster, the posterior zygoma could not be where we would want it to be. Uh, worked for a long time, but I could not place this implant without running to the running into the anterior implant or running out of bone and ruining the rest of the zygoma that was possibly we could use later on. So what I had to do is to angle this implant significantly and to essentially stand it up to engage the infraorbital rim. And I can tell you that that was one of the most difficult implants that I placed because of access. It was very, very difficult to get access to placement of that implant. So I learned a hard way that you can see the position of this implant is very vertical. And it's actually engaging the infraorbital, infraorbital rim instead of the zygoma. So the key thing is that when you treatment plan your zygomas, when you're executing your zygoma surgeries, is that the position of the implants, the posterior, the anterior, are predetermined. The implants always have to go in the proper position, even if you're placing one, always anticipate that a second month, second one may be needed. And at that time, we thought that we were good to go. This was, case was uh, obviously uh, had been uh, pretty uh, complicated, but we thought we were good. Then other problems start to happen. And these two slides, the left and the right, did not happen simultaneously. I'm just putting them together for the sake of our presentation today. They happened months apart. They start to have, we start to have inflammation, infection, and dehiscences around these implants. And again, you can see that these side by side, but they did not happen the same time. That would be too easy. This had to happen months, months apart so that I could really get the full benefit of this case from hell. But you can see that I opened the, opened the, the areas, had extensive infection and loss of uh, bone, debrided both sides, treated the surfaces of the implant. Sometimes I do uh, essentially enamelplasty or uh, removing of the titanite surface of the implants and polishing them. And then advancement of buccal fat pads on both sides uh, and then watertight closure. And this is to uh, essentially create a scar, create more uh, soft tissue thickness around the sites. The other things that I have done or can be done is use of a, a resorbable membrane, and also uh, an allergenic, allergenic uh, uh, dermal graft. That's something that I've used with great success. PRF or blood products are also uh, something that we use and could be helpful. And the case was that closed up and has done reasonably well and is uh, maturing. So what did I learn in this case? Obviously, uh, the position and the trajectory of the implants are predetermined. 
your implants or zygoma implants, whether you're doing one or two, anterior or posterior, always have to go in their predetermined position. That's not, you want to always keep in mind that this patient may have to be transitioned into a quad zygoma case later on. And I thought I was the only one that would have this problem, but obviously other people have had it too. Secondly, is don't trust the alveolar anchorage. Don't trust those anterior implants, even the posterior implants. They could always fail. So position your zygoma implants in positions that you could always transition the patient into a quad zygoma if needed. And secondly, augmentation of the soft tissue around the zygoma and pay extra uh, close attention to what the, uh, the quality of the bone and how much bone you can maintain around the crest, around the neck of the implants, and to in ensure that you have thick tissue around the collar of the implant. With that said, I'd like to invite you all to California someday, and uh, I thank you for your time. Thank you, Human. Again, a, a great teaching case, and uh, it's so impressive to be able to uh, learn uh, some of the, from some of the uh, complications that, that we have and share, again, among ourselves. And certainly what you showed was a, a great uh, proof of concept, uh, more or less, with regard to the problems that we can see uh, from both the heart and especially soft tissue perspective. How you handled the case, I think, was impressive. And uh, again, um, indicative of what we can and will see uh, with cases that we do. So thank you once again for a wonderful presentation. Thank you.